So Unicraft is actually an open source project that we started at uh, NEC while we were experimenting and playing around with unicorns in the past. Um, so I'm also from that research lab where I'm coming from. So it's in Heidelberg, based in Germany. And I'm a senior researcher there and also the lead maintainer of that open source project. So uh, you probably are aware that VMs are around for a while. Um, and they were uh, really good in uh, features like uh, consolidation, migration, and isolation. And then this hype of containers happened, and they became much more popular. People use them now, and they're actually pretty great. But what you hear them from these people is uh, they're much easier to use because uh, I have this Docker file, and I go. Uh, my containers are much smaller than your VMs. My VM usually is 10 gigabytes, but my container is just 100 of megabytes. And uh, they're also much faster to bring up. Uh, the VM takes minutes to boot, but the container is up in, in, in a few seconds. And then we say usually, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Maybe all correct, but actually did you hear about unicorns? Because uh, you should be aware that uh, VMs still have uh, some, some advantages that uh, you not necessarily get from co uh, container environments, and most importantly is, is, is strong isolation. So let's, let's give, uh, give you a really short overview of what a unicorn is. Um, let's take this example. On the left side, you see um, and, and, and cloud service deployed with virtual machines. Um, and each uh, service uh, entity is, is one application running in an own uh, uh, isolation box, so in an own uh, virtual machine. You have then a standard operating system underneath, meaning of most of the time it's a, li a Linux kernel. You run on a hypervisor. It might be KVM, Zen, or VMware, or whatever you deploy. And uh, yeah, it's quite heavyweight, right? The stack is quite big. So what do we do in unicorns? So first of all, we want to keep the same service as before. So uh, we take that application, keep it still in the isolation boundary. But what we do is replacing that general purpose kernel and um, put a, a purpose-built kernel towards that application underneath. So you see that service A has a different kernel underneath than uh, application B. Um, that whole thing is a monolithic binary um, that contains just a, a few kernel layers and the application, and also only features that the application needs. Um, you don't need isolation anymore if you have that assumption that you have anyway just one application in one virtual machine. So you don't separate between uh, user space and kernel space anymore. Um, which gives you also the advantage that you have further freedom in further specializing the, the kernel towards your application, right? You can tweak and tune it so that it uh, performs that task quite well. So the gains that we found uh, with our previous research uh, doing that, mainly coming from a uh, network uh, function virtualization space, is fast instantiation, destruction, and migration times in order of tens of milliseconds, uh, a really low memory footprint of few megabytes of RAM. You could achieve extremely high density of these services, so we were able on a single hardware server, x86, to run 10,000 guests, and then we run out of RAM. Um, we could achieve high performance by, by just using a single gas CPU, so we're easily uh, able to cope with 10 or 40 gigabits uh, network throughput at that time. So it's kind of, that number is already two, three years old, but uh, even there, I demonstrated already how fast it, this stuff can go. And last but not least, you have also a reduced attack surface because you have the argument that you have much less components in a unicorn. And Next to it, the strong isolation is provided by your hypervisor uh, environment. So what I want to do is give you just a few graphs you know, to demonstrate uh, what we found there in, uh, from our research work. So let's talk about the instantiation times. So you see on the horizontal axis the number of uh, simultaneous uh, running instances in the system. 
what we take here is, because it's a baseline measure measurement, uh, an, an application that actually does nothing, just comes up and tells, okay, now I'm here, and then it just stays in the system. Um, and on the uh, um, vertical axis, you see the instantiation time of the nth um, um, guess that was created. And also, please aware, this is a logarithmic scale. So we start with that application as a standard Linux process, uh, and we get numbers like 0 0.7 to 10 milliseconds of creation time if we create like 1,000 on the machine. If you put that into Docker, that is still good, but it is increasing uh, uh, already to 150 to 550 milliseconds. But if you take now a standard VM, so let's say just uh, debootstrap Debian, uh, and then wait until that application is up. Uh, it's especially if, if there are lots of VMs in the system, that, that time goes up to 82 seconds. And then uh, let's take a unicorn doing the same thing, right? Um, and then also running as a VM. And uh, we are around uh, uh, 63 to 1.4 seconds. And I want to add here as well that this measurement didn't modify any, anything on, on the tool stack, which we also did in our research. So if you're interested, I can point you to some papers um, where we uh, replaced uh, the tool stack with something written from scratch, which is much more lightweight than standard Zen. And then we could boot even in 30 milliseconds or less that uh, unikernel. But so far, so good. In uh, performance, um, to show you a purpose-built HTTP web server. So it's completely purpose-built, nothing ported. Um, in terms of throughput, you have here a Debian um, virtual machine running Nginx. So this is, this is the DN. You have a Debian um, virtual machine li running light HTTPD. Uh, the T means here it's, uh, it's Tinyx, which uh, is actually a, a small compiled Linux kernel, then just running uh, the process directly from the init RAM disk. They're all getting one CPU assigned um, and uh, the same amount of RAM assigned. I think it was 512 megabytes or something. And, and uh, the, the, the file system is served from, from RAM disk if there's any. So in, in, in terms of throughput, you see here not that much of an advantage as soon as we go more up to parallel co connections because the bottleneck here is the actual uh, hardware NIC because you have so many offloading features in the meantime like segmentation offloading and so forth. The interesting part is dealing with requests per second. And the yellow part is our, uh, actually our unikernel and we are six times faster with the same resources in, in that virtual machine environment. Uh, just being extremely purpose-built to that use case. So, um, application domains. So, unikernels you can actually have in a wide, big area and fields. And it's also that we found that the properties that unikernels give you, um, each use case makes use of a different set. Let's say. So what do we have? We have actually fast migration and destroy time. There we would go in something like reactive NFV, so imagine web servers that just pop up when your request is coming into your server, or serverless, or Amazon Lambda, and you know these, these kinds of things. We have extremely high resource efficiency, um, also good for serverless. If you, if you consider you have high consolidation, lots of serverless tasks on a, on a machine. IoT and mobile edge computing, where you go into an area where you have um, more resource-constrained devices that host your services on the edge of the network. High performance, really important for uh, network function virtualization, also mobile edge computing. Um, and then mission critical, um, because we have a lower attack surface, potentially we would have a cheaper verification which is then getting interesting for even industrial um, um, IoT uh, cases or even automotive. And you may ask here now, so this is all great, so we have similar speed and size as containers or even less. Um, we have then even strong isolation and security, but why is not everybody actually using it? This, uh, that's a bit weird. And the problem is actually the development of these unicorns. So each of these highly optimized unicorns is, until now, uh, a manual task. Um, you, 
it takes really months or even longer. So if you, let's say, have the, the, the target to, to create a, a web server with the Unicorn, you start you know, developing here, then a driver there, and then you choose, choose a, a hypervisor where you want to support it, and then you make use of there, uh, of some specialization um, features uh, so that it runs quite well on that platform. And then somebody else comes along, cool, but now I want to run it on KVM, and you're like, okay, I can start from the beginning because you have different drivers, you have a different virtualization environment, and so forth. So it's a throwaway in the end, right? So and then even imagine you come now with a different application like a database server or something. You start the whole process again and again. And that's, uh, in fact, not something you actually want in, in, in a more production environment. So and this is where we come along with, with Unicraft, where we actually want to provide a bit like a, a, a unikernel build framework. Um, so the motivation that we set us is we want to support a really wide range of use cases, meaning also supporting wide range of specialization techniques or whatever you want to do in your unikernel environment. Meaning also to us, probably don't know what the end users actually are, the, the unikernel developers actually using for optimizing his use case. So we should be uh, open also for that and not dictate any, any design decisions. Um, we want to simplify the building and optimizing process, simplify porting of existing applications. So most applications luckily use something like, uh, for instance, the POSIX API. So, um, that, that's a good uh, share point. Um, and then also for um, lots of these unicorn projects to, to get rid of this throwaway argument or uh, a problem, uh, we want to have a more common and shared code base for uh, all these unicorn projects that they can you know, just reuse. And with one compile, we want to also support different hypervisor and CPU architectures. And this is actually Unicraft, where we uh, use, it's, it's a quite well-known concept, like uh, where we say everything is a library, but in our case also OS functionalities are libraries, and we provide multiple implementations for schedulers, for instance, or memory allocators. Um, and Unicraft actually consists of two main components. One is the library pool, and the other thing is the build tool itself. So let's give you an overview. In the library pool, we, decide, uh, we distinguish actually into three uh, types of libraries. Uh, one is the, the main uh, libraries, which are kind of independent of uh, actually any target execution environments. This could be network stacks. Um, this could be file systems, uh, scheduler implementations, uh, libc's, drivers, and so forth and so forth. Then we have the uh, uh, libraries that are specialized for an hypervised execution environment like Zen or KVM or VMware or whatever you want. And then uh, architecture libraries that is like the last piece of missing pieces for uh, implementing um, um, CPU requirements for your Unicorn. So you take or you create or build your application Select and configure the libraries you want to uh, use in that case. Type make. And the build system is then creating you uh, multiple unikernel images, each fitted to uh, or specialized to the target platform that you want to running on. Um, also, I, I, what I need to add here is that the system is also built so that you can come and replace rep libraries in that pool or even add your own libraries to it as well. Let's say one may say uh, Lightweight IP is a nice network stack because it's small, but it doesn't give me all the TCP features that I need for my application, so I'd rather get for something big. I uh, would like to run a, a ported BSD network stack, so then he would select, select a different network stack, or maybe he has an own written network stack, so he would you know, just uh, take his library instead. An example system, um, imagine you have a Python script you, that you want to unikernelize. Um, you would just select a, a language environment. In this case, this would be you know, MicroPython uh, coming from the embedded world, network stack, VFS, and whatever you need. And uh, 
you get your unikernel just running, executing your Python script. The build tool is um, quite close to what um, you're used to when you use Linux. So it's kconfig based and has also lots of make file magic behind. But the workflow is actually make menu config. Then you see like, you know, uh, uh, different options where you can then start uh, selecting the um, libraries that you need, configure them, uh, choose your target platforms. And after, afterwards, it's just a simple make, and you have your images. To give you some numbers uh, as a baseline example, so I will show you uh, after, after the slides uh, actually uh, a bit more real-world demo with, uh, with a small um, network stack that replies to, to uh, HTTP with HTTP requests, uh, HTTP replies. Um, to give you a baseline, um, when we started the project, we could uh, compile a small unikernel that does nothing else than just come up, say, here I am, and shuts down afterwards uh, with uh, 32.7 kilobytes. And um, also, you had only to assign 208 kilobytes of RAM to get that thing running, although we had to modify the tool stack because uh, hypervisor builders thought less than 4 megabytes you will never have, right? <laughs> so. Um, even there, <laughs> you had to remove these hard-coded limits. What is going to happen soon? So we are around now since one year. So I announced actually in uh, last FOSDEM uh, the this, this start of the project. So we have now an upcoming release in the upcoming week, uh, uh, which uh, gets a new uh, version tag 0.3. Um, what you will have in there already is support for Zen, KVM, Linux, and even a, a bit uh, experimental bare metal port for various architectures. Um, as core functionality, we provide you uh, a core scheduler library, although a preemptive scheduler library is in work currently. Um, then a binary body um, managed heap allocator, although you could also replace that one if you don't want that. Um, we have pretty new in that release networking, which is um, where we introduced an, an API, which is pretty close what you may know from Intel DBDK. Um, it's still interrupt driven, but it's, uh, it provides you, you know, specialization features like you can batch number of packets and so forth. Library IP as a first TCP IP stack to the system. We have a, a, a VFS implementation where we then can move on later to add file systems underneath that we can mount in there. And then uh, the two libc's that we have for now is no libc, which is a written one in the Unicraft ecosystem to support you know more minimalistic build. But most applications use some more fancy POSIX uh, um, functions. So for that purpose, we have also new lib available. On the roadmap, uh, we, ha we, uh, we have, um, we want to concentrate our effort on uh, getting more complete ARM64 support. Actually, it's uh, the ARM folks uh, by themselves providing us uh, the ARM64 um, um, architecture and platform support for, for KVM. Um, we have uh, started uh, internally uh, playing around with more libraries like Muscle, LibUV, Zlib, OpenSSL, and so forth, which are more like for, for cloud, cloud environments, more standard components that you need in your software stack. Since we have a focus on uh, serverless, we also looking in uh, 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 language runtimes like JavaScript, Python, Ruby, C++, and so forth. Um, we want to come up uh, with an uh, OCI container target support so, um, so that you can even build a container image that you could just launch in your container environment instead of just having a virtual machine image. Um, file systems will come up with, with uh, first of all, with an in-RAM uh, uh, file system, but then also with uh, block drivers to support actually reading something from virtual disks uh, or 9PFS, actually. Um, then uh, network drivers, since we have Vert.io uh, for now only, um, we have in the pipe Zen uh, with NetFront and for the Linux target, uh, a, a tab driver. 
And then also I uh, want to support uh, frameworks like you know, Node.js, PyTorch for maybe machine learning tasks on, uh, in the network, uh, Intel DVDK, we actually would like to port the whole framework to Unicraft so that you would build uh, Unikernel NFV boxes directly. Yeah, and it's open source and actually uh, we still need support <laughs> because we have actually quite a lot of stuff to do. Um, so as I said, actually we started uh, uh, December 2017 um, under, uh, well, actually as an incub incubator project in, uh, from the Zen project. So it's also covered by the Linux Foundation. We get actually quite nice support for them. Uh, the community grew since then. So um, we started with two contributors. We are now at 23. Um, mainly we have, uh, to mention the big contributions from Romania, we got uh, networking and scheduling support uh, which from, from uh, uh, professors and students uh, from university in uh, Bucharest. From Israel we had uh, someone that um, was looking in, into bare metal support and was providing a VGA driver so that you could actually, without any hypervisor underneath, run Unicraft directly on hardware. And from China, there is a lab from ARM that uh, actively works and contributes for the 64-bit um, support for ARM, which is quite nice. Um, we actually are mailing list based, uh, our project. So we have, actually, we, we hijacked the MiniOS Devel um, mailing list from Zen. Maybe you heard about that. Um, the idea is also uh, maybe in longer term we are able to replace that MiniOS uh, uh, unikernel base there so that um, also the Zen folks uh, have something to build there, um, their stop domains or something for that. Then we have an IRC channel on Freenode called Unicraft. And uh, yeah, so probably I flushed you now. Let's go for a bit demo time. And then uh, you get some more references and points um, and we can also then uh, do a, a question round. So, what I wanna go, do, going to show you is actually, um, probably you all had, had a textbook uh, that explained you how to program a socket on, on a Unix system. Um, so that you need to have a socket call you just set addresses, bind it, and, and this is now being a socket server that is going to listen on, on, uh, on a port. And you have a simple while loop that then will just, as soon there is a connection and the first byte arriving, it will just send a static string, which is by chance something that is HTTP 1.1 compatible here, uh, and sends out a web page. So this should uh, demonstrate you a bit uh, uh, one of our targets that we want to have uh, a unikernel that is uh, kind of the same way as you would run or develop your application for a standard operating system. So let's go here. Um, you have uh, here main.c, this is the program. You have a make file that uh, I can show you, um, that looks like quite similar to a Linux, uh, external Linux kernel module. So you get, get another make call invoked that then kicks in the Unicraft build system. And then you have a makefile.uk which actually describes for Unicraft which modules do you have or actually which source files do you have and so forth. Um, which adds actually just main.c uh, to the build and registers uh, a library which we call here now app HTTP reply. <coughs> so and if we type make, uh, I did make already. Let's do clean so that uh, I can prove you it builds. It's now building a KVM virtual machine image, the network stack. Um, and at last, Okay, some, some ellipses, scheduling, and then you have the final KVM image. In the menu config, oops, Wait. oh no, I broke it. Ah, yes, yes, yes. 
yeah, that's a that's a funny kick config thing. <laughs> so um, you see here, you have a menu for architecture selection. So I build it now for x86, but you can choose also, you know, other architectures. Platform is like uh, one cent, KVM, and so forth. Although we have only networking support on KVM for now. Uh, on the libraries, you see here is library IP. We could go in here and select features in there. We could even build a network stack without TCP support. It's actually funny to call it then still TCP IP stack. Um, and so forth, right? You see it's, a, it's quite of uh, libraries are in there. Uh, we have some build options. Um, and, and that's it, right? And uh, if I run that now as a KVM guest, so do you see that line or maybe I move up the window a little bit? I load the kernel image. HTTP apply KVM and I need to attach it because it has networking to a network bridge. Uh -huh, wonderful, I have mistyped here. So now it's up already, you see uh, it was going through the virtual bias, was loading the image, this is still Kimu. And then uh, from this point on it was the unikernel. It found its network device, brought it up, and then the DHCP server in, in background replied with this address. So what we can do here now, we can ping that host. Um, 172. So let's see the response. That you believe me, I will kill now the guest. It's not responding anymore. Nothing happens. I reboot it. And here it's back again. Right, and then if you want, you can see also the web page served. Oops. Oh, God. I think next time I will clone the screen so I see the console <laughs> here too. <laughs> ah. Wait, proxy configuration. Yes. So it came, got, got surfed, and it's that string that got sent. Right. So the kernel image itself, or let's say the unikernel, is just 222 kilobytes in size. So quite small, actually. Um, and now to show you that it's the same program, you can just go and uh, you know take GCC and build it as a Linux application. Now we have a dot out, right? which is, of course, smaller because we don't have a Vertio driver in here and so forth, but it does, does the same thing, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, open for questions, if we have a bit of time. I understand the like um, isolation guarantees and stuff. I'm wondering if just sort of operationally there are additional challenges to monitoring and operationalizing a unikernel. So yeah, that's actually a good question because as, um, the thing is, it depends what you build into your unikernel, right? You could say I uh, do it as minimalistic as possible, which is actually our main target. But then you don't have like a shell or something in there anymore, so you can't SSH into it. So you're kind of uh, um, forced to use the tool that the hypervisor environment uh, provides you. But at the same time, we could still say, in, um, and it's also what we have a bit in, in, in our mind on the agenda, it's not written actually, is uh, to provide a library that gives you kind of remote access maybe with the REST API or whatever, so that you can even look what's going inside, uh, uh, what's, what's happening inside the unit kernel. <laughs> you said you uh, basically run everything in a flat address space. I guess uh, the application then runs in user, uh, super user mode? Yes. Every you yeah. substitute the POSIX API with, instead of system calls with function calls? Right. Okay. Yeah. 
Actually, uh, probably I should repeat what he said for the recording, right? So, so <laughs> the question was, uh, um, or actually more a confirmation, that uh, we run everything in uh, super user mode, so it's kernel space in our perspective. And uh, calling something from, from the POSIX API is just for us a function call and there's no system call. So, more question? Yeah. How far does it support that driver from, let's say, a Linux kernel? So the, so, the question is how hard is the driver, uh, how hard is it to port a driver from, from the Linux kernel? Here, I need to say it's pretty hard because we have a different license. Uh, <laughs> we, use, we use BSD and actually, you know, to allow you also, uh, you know, build up some, 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 some uni kernels that use non-GPL software or a library that is non-GPL. So yeah, Linux is for us a no-go, but actually we would uh, look into BSD, uh, these, these OSs to port something. Um, that kind of depends what you want to port. So for now we have just a, um, a networking subsystem with you know, um, defined APIs for the drivers. And we on purpose you know, looked at DBDK because there everything runs in user space. They have kind of a similar thing of a library system there. And we thought, okay, we maybe can you reuse those network drivers. How this will look like for other drivers, let's see. It depends which APIs we will come up. Um, but on the other hand, since you're targeted on virtualized environments, it's not that you need you know, a whole bunch of uh, tons of drivers. What you need to support is the uh, virtual uh, driver model of your hypervisor environment. Yeah. Yeah, um, great project. I think we need something like Docker for unicorns. <laughs> about your experience with LWIP because I can see that this would be the TCP IP stack that you picked for a uh, first prototype to the implementation. But my experience is that if you want performance and especially in the presence of multiprocessing, LWIP IP being focused on embedded systems, it won't cut it likely. Yep. So what, are, what are your experiences and do you have a roadmap or plan for the future? So what are the, the question is, what are the experience with Light RP? Uh, there I need to agree, it's uh, quite limited. Uh, in, in that sense, if you run uh, you know, multiple threads or whatever, this can be uh, quickly a bottleneck. Also, features what are missing still um, are uh, you know, supporting segmentation offloading, for instance, to make use of you know, 64 kilobyte packets that you can send to, to, your, to your actually NIC driver that runs on the hypervisor host, and then the NIC is ch uh, chopping the, the that TCP segment into smaller packets. Um, so what, for that, we actually have on the roadmap that we want uh, to port a, a, a network stack from BSD. For which BSD? Let's see. If, if probably we can also do the shortcut to go through OSV. OSV is also a unicorn project, and they ported it already. Um, so we have maybe a more, bit more new environment so, so that the extraction from an existing kernel environment is a bit, bit easier for us. Uh, what about language support, both as a languages for application stuff, but then also languages for components within your system? So, like so the question is about language support for components of the system or also applications. And this is what we are uh, actually, after that release, really trying to focus on. Uh, especially, you know, languages that are really popular like JavaScript and so forth in these cloud environments. Um, let's say uh, probably it's still someone looking a bit deeper in order to make even system libraries be able to be compiled with the, with the whole system. Um, I'm not sure yet where, where, where there are pitfalls or not, but I could still imagine, um, at least for C++, it's quite easy to bind that to, to C code. Uh, so that some of the system libraries could be in C++, and then you need, you know, um, this, this extra small code that you need for exception handling and so forth that uh, with C++ comes. But I could also imagine something like Go, which is also a compiled language and is easy to uh, link with, with Z code. A garbage collector we would need then, which I usually don't like, but <laughs> that language requires it. Um, yeah, so I guess this is more... Um, they can be answered when we have some more language environments ported and then it's trying out and uh, see what's missing. And are you aware of active efforts in the community to work to do that? 
Um, so we just started with uh, Python. So we actually took the MicroPython project that is down there and got a, a nice um, unikernel running Python programs running. Um, we uh, also um, looked into uh, V8, which is the Node.js JavaScript engine. There we're still missing some, some POSIX functionality to get it actually uh, working, but I think we probably this year we may, might be able to, to reach that point. And also, you know, Ruby, we have a student that is interested in, in, in porting Ruby to it, so we need, we need developers. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.